This episode of the Planet Microcap podcast is brought to you by Friedman LLP, a top 40 global accounting, tax, and business consulting and advisory firm, providing a full spectrum of services for public and private companies since 1924. Contact Friedman when you will need to raise capital and adhere to U.S. standards. The Friedman partners will work diligently with you to provide the financial assurance, regulatory, and transactional services you need. When the stakes are highest, Friedman makes sure you are well equipped. For more information and to get a Friedman free consultation, please call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com. Again, for more information and a free consultation, call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E at FriedmanLLP.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities at any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-E-F-T. You're listening to episode 180. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rkraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. Save the date. We have announced our next virtual conference, which is titled the SNN Network Summer Virtual Event, which will be held on August 17th through 19th, 2021. The website is now live and you can find the full details on the event at conference.snn.network. Registration is now open, so click the register button once you're there, and you'll be notified of all our latest announcements. Our first one coming up is going to be speakers, initial speakers, and sponsors. So again, it is the SNN Network Summer Virtual Event happening on August 17th through 19, 2021. The website to register is conference.snn.network. I look forward to seeing you all there. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Jeff Moore. He's a full-time investor in both real estate and equities, and he's the editor of the Ragnar is a Pirate blog. Uh, I, I've been following Jeff for a long time now, and I'm really stoked to have him on the pod. And a special shout out to Richard Sosa for saying that Jeff has some great investing stories. I don't mean to spoil anything, but he, he actually shares a few of them. Uh, we also chat about understanding the value of a trade, you know, from the days of trading baseball cards and then to equities. So thank you again for tuning in to episode 180 of the Planet Microcap podcast. And please enjoy my conversation with Jeff Moore. back everybody to the planet microcap podcast i'm your host robert Kraft. you can follow me on twitter at bobby k Kraft. that's b-o-b-b-y k-k-r-a-f-t and joining me today uh this is somebody that i've been following on twitter for a while now um and he's got a blog called ragnar is a pirate he's got a big bet going on where there's a whole bunch of people that might get tattoos uh, if, if certain things hit and he also on the side does does some uh, single family real estate investments as well. So we got, there's so many things that we can cover today, but let me introduce him. It's Jeff Moore. Jeff, thank you for joining me today. How you doing? Hey, good. Thanks for having me, Robbie. It's great to have you on, man. So, I, well, all right. So I alluded to this already. You got to start off. Like, what's this bet going on? Like, so how many people now might be getting the tattoo? Like, what, what's going on? Yeah, so we're up to 15 people on it, and it was something I, you know, was just kind of bullshitting about, and uh, throw out a crazy price target for my, my favorite stock holding, uh, and, and actually, I, I mostly even warrants in it, is uh, Thrive, 
And uh, it kind of, you know, grew from there. And then I said, you know, hey, if it hits 250, you know, I'll get a tattoo. And I'm not a tattoo guy. This would actually be the first tattoo that I would ever get. So I was like, well, you know, I appreciate absurdity. So, uh, you know, some people agreed on it. And then I had an artist mock one up. And I told him I wanted it to be like a garbage pail kids meets like a Brickleberry sort of thing with uh, the CEO of the company killing a bear with a phone book. And so I had a couple mock-ups made and maybe we can get a poll going or something for which one of these I would get. But like, you know, we've got this one right here. Oh, that's so good. I feel, I feel bad for anybody listening to the audio. Go to the YouTube version of this so you can yeah. see these mock-ups because these are hilarious. Yeah. So, I mean, I personally think I prefer this forest one because I, I really like trees. I've got like 75 trees at my house that I planted and do a bunch of like bonsai shit with. And uh <laughs> Anyway, but this explosion one's pretty cool too. Uh, maybe we could change it to have like fireballs and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, it's got like, you know, the Barrett's brains are coming out and his eyeballs popping out. Like I said, it's very, very garbage pail kid style. And, uh, you know, I like, the trees. I like yeah. the trees one. I, I think I, if I had to have a vote, I think the trees one has, has a good vibe. Yeah. So, you know, so yeah, it's, it's find the poll, everybody, and we'll, we'll figure it out. And then, and then maybe, you know, if it hits it, then we'll, we'll have a, uh, a poll for where I should get the tattoo uh, <laughs> place. Uh, no, anyway, it's kind of a way to have fun. Yeah. Oh man, oh that's too funny. I love it, man. I well, listen, I, you know, look, I'm not a shareholder, and I don't, I don't even know what Thrive does, but I hope it happens just so I can see this tattoo happen because <laughs> yeah. it's not just you. That's a big tattoo for anybody that said that they're gonna uh, join in on this. I think they're looking at that now and be like, oh. Well, well, they, they, they maybe, maybe I should invest them. more. Maybe I should buy more shares just in case that does happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to make it worth it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, that was, that was good stuff. That was good stuff. Hey Jeff, let's take let's let's take it all the way back, man. So you know, wh wh what's your background? You know, I, I, where did your passion for investing begin? To the point like where now we have tattoos in the balance. <laughs> right. So yeah. So I mean, it started like I was a kid. You know, like I mean, in baseball. Uh, you know, and, and collecting baseball cards and trading with friends and stuff, you know, I always loved that. Um, and, uh, you know, then at some point, you know, I, I started, you know, getting some shares of, you know, Pepsi and Tricon and there was a spinoff that happened and, you know, and, and, and kind of reading about that and, and, and learning things that way and thinking about, you know, on an elementary level kind of compounding, you know, you see, okay, I have, you know, 10 shares of Pepsi Corp or whatever that are $70 a piece or whatever it was trading for in 1995. <clears throat> and they grow over time. And, you know, I thought that, that was a really fascinating concept. And, um, you know, then there would just be, you know, things that would pop up, but, you know, I always had like a hustle, like I'd mow grass. And like when I was a really little kid, I would like uh, walk around the, the little downtown that I, I grew up in picking up like aluminum cans and like, you know, we'd take them and recycle them because I couldn't get a job. And I'm like, well, I want some extra money. Um, just random stuff like that. And so, you know, at some point, you know, when I was like, uh, I guess 18, I got a job in a pawn shop that I, I, I loved. It's probably my favorite job I've ever had. And, um, you know, I, I got to, you know, play with gold and guns and guitars all day. And, uh, you know, we get to figure out the values of these things and lend money against them and, and all that. And then at some point, you know, I started buying stuff from pawn shops and selling it on eBay and kind of exploiting these like little microcosms where somebody doesn't know what they've got. Right. And um, it's amazing what you can do if you kind of develop a niche for that. Um, you know, I mean, in college, I actually financed all of my partying off of going to pawn shops in Lexington and I, I can't tell you how many TI-83 calculators I bought for $25 and sold for 70 on eBay. Um, you know, stuff like that. Oh, that's my, that is like my yeah. favorite line, I think, of the podcast that I've ever heard. Oh, yeah. that's so, that's so, I, I know the TI-83 calculator. You know, yeah. I think anybody who's ever had a math class, I think that's in our age range, like knows the TI-83. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, so that and then like, you know, my, my, my grandparents, they probably had like 30 rent houses and my uncle, he, he grew a, a, a decently sized single family rental portfolio. And I kind of saw what they did with it. And then at some point I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm in college now. I can, you know, either have my parents pay for me to live on campus or rent from somebody else, or I can just buy a duplex. So I used money I had saved up uh, from stocks and stuff, down payment on the duplex. Um you know, refinanced at the, at the peak of the real estate bubble. 
uh, cashed out a whole bunch of money, paid cash for some townhouses, did some creative financing, rolled that over into others, and you know, kept doing the stock stuff. Um, you know, would read on that, and you know, I, I read a book on Warren Buffett, kind of figured out he talked about Ben Graham a lot, so maybe I should look up Ben Graham. So I read The Intelligent Investor. Um, I actually almost got kicked out of a couple economics classes because I was reading it in the class while the professor was lecturing. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, I, I loved that book. I couldn't put it down. Um, so I mean, I, I probably read it in a week and a half, something like that. And uh, just kept reading and, you know, eventually I found the corner of Berkshire and Fairfax a message board when it was still good. Um, it's really gone downhill, but um so anyway, found that, started the blog up uh, and, and just met a bunch of really cool people through talking stocks, you know, and I, I, I would do that, you know, kind of when I wasn't working on the, the, the houses I was renovating. And, um, you know, so there was kind of a split of time. And um, yes, yeah, so I just kind of continued with that. And, you know, at some point, you know, that, that, that got us to where we are now. That's really cool. You know, what's, you know, what's really cool about your background. And like, I, I share some of this is, is especially when I was, I traded baseball cards too. When I was, when I, yeah. was younger. I still have them somewhere in a, in the storage somewhere. <laughs> I probably should, I don't know if, I don't know if the, the collectible card is still booming or the craze is still booming, but I, I don't know. I left uh, there's, there's hanging out somewhere, but it's, it's, it's just trying to understand value. And then, and then from, and then developing that entrepreneurial spirit behind that, where you're like, okay, this card, I feel like is, it might be worth this. Or like, did you read the Beckett books? You, you, yeah. you read all, yeah. Yeah. I, like I, I would carry them around with me and just absorb it. I mean, like, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I feel like, you know, every 10 years, there's kind of like a hip uh, mental illness to have. Right. And like, you know, when we were kids, it was like ADD and they gave everybody a riddle. And then at some point it, it became, you know, uh, high functioning uh, Asperger's, right? Like, you know, and I was doing that sort of thing as a kid. I would just constantly be memorizing these prices and additions and yeah. all these different things in the, the, the cards. Uh, I was obsessed with it. And um, yeah. Yeah. No, I was that same. And, but like, and then once you were able to understand, like, things have value and there are people that then want to take these things and might want to buy it from you for more because they think that it's worth more. Like it's, it's, it's interesting how you, that like just that, that one experience, baseball cards of all things. And it helps you. And it, and it kind of, it shows you the path of like, well, not just what business can be, but just being an entrepreneur and all these other areas that you can then go and make money and, and apply that those same principles to, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and something that I kind of wonder is like, you know, you, you look back at, you know, the friends that you like did ball cards or like, I, I, I there was this uh, game kind of like magic, the gathering that I really oh, like yeah. as a teenager um, called star Wars CCG. And so, cause I'm a star Wars nerd and um, you know, I really enjoyed that card game a lot and you know, the trading aspects of that. <clears throat> and so and everyone did it. And I kind of wonder what is different in like different people's brain structure, brain chemistry that like makes somebody be like, you know, get that pleasure chemical of like making a trade. Like, Oh, I got, you know, this card for this card and that's better because of X, Y, Z in this book that I read and, and all this other stuff. Like and what, you know, cause it, it almost goes with the entrepreneurial spirit. I mean, what makes somebody inherently more likely to be an entrepreneur than somebody that doesn't want to be? I mean, neither one of those things are, are good or bad. It's just the, that, that, that wiring is, is, is kind of fascinating. I mean, I wish I understood it better. I, you know, let's talk. I mean, I, I do too, because I think back at those times and I'm like, would my friends want to keep trading? With, like, let's say, you know, all else things being equal, let's say like we were still, you know, trading cards up until this day, you know, like, would they still want to do that trade with me? You know, if, <laughs> if uh, I, let's say I had, cause like I was, I was, I, I was a Knicks. I'm a Knicks fan, and I was. I am a Knicks fan, and mm -hmm. but I was. I always was a Michael Jordan fan too, because oh, I yeah. was like, I know he's going to kill the Knicks. It's fine. Like I mm -hmm. just, what are we going to do? There's nothing we can do. Um, <laughs> so like I always focused on trying to collect as many Michael Jordan cards and whatever capacity. Like I had like the Tar Heel, like when he when he was on the Carolina Tar Heels, like not even like a real card. It was like a. It was almost like a card with it, but I didn't care. It was just like. Give me as much Michael Jordan stuff. So I would make certain trades. It's just like, yo, you want this rookie Stefan Marbury card for that, 
Jordan, I, I, that might not have been the trade. I'm just thinking for example, because this is what like 90 when, when Marbury got drafted. I, but maybe, maybe it was uh, it was it was a uh, uh, Camby. Maybe I trade Marcus Camby card before he went to the Knicks. You know, I yeah. like a like a Marcus Camby rookie and say this guy is going to be legit, man. You know, and then getting like whatever Jordan card that might be without understanding maybe the person understanding like this is probably the greatest athlete of all time potentially. Like this card, whatever the form it might be will be worth something more. It's just, it's, it's fascinating to me. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny to think of, uh, of uh, Stephon Marbury and Marcus Camby and stuff, you know, growing up, like I, I haven't thought of those names in a while. Um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's funny to think back to like that early, that like late nineties time. I mean, I, I'm 32. So like for me, like my formative, like sports years was 96 mm-hmm. to like, Oh, one, you know, yeah. and so and being a Yankee fan at that time, I was out, I'm a Jeter, you know, neophyte, I guess mm-hmm. you'd say. And so like, you know, that, that's when it was a, it was a fun time to be a New York fan. That's for sure. I mean, Knicks were always in it. Rangers had Gretzky for a couple of years and then yeah. you know, the giant, the giant sucked, but like, you know, everything else is good, <laughs> but anyways. Okay. No. Uh, all right. So we, so we've gone down this road talking about baseball cars and like how, for you that it you you really developed this not just entrepreneurial spirit but this idea that you can buy and sell things and potentially make more on things that you own or that people might be mis mis uh, undervaluing Mm -hmm. so what 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 then led to so you started the blog ragnar is a pirate you know what did you want to convey on there were you trying to meet people talk more about your investment philosophy grow as an investor you know what was your goals yeah i mean kind of all the above um i mean i remember the first post I ever made on that uh, blog was uh, was on um, a company called uh, DataRam, and it was a, a net net at the time, and it was trading for like two thirds of net cash. And I was so convinced that the market was so stupid, and I was so brilliant because I found this thing. And you know, it, it, if you would look up DataRam, it's I I think that they actually wound up going bankrupt or something. They they were able to burn through that cash pile because they did a stupid acquisition. And just they continued to dilute shareholders and stuff. It was really dumb. So, you know, it was a really good thing that kind of helped humble, you know, probably at the time, 20, 21 year old Jeff, um, you know, who would just, you know, seize, you know, the bull by the horns and was just convinced that this whole like, you know, net net thing could never screw up. And, um, you know, I, I was lucky with that one because I, you know, I think I made some money on the trade because it, it traded up, you know, and then I sold it once it was above that cash. But that that saved me from other dumb mistakes in the future because I, I I kept looking at it, right? So part of it was like, you know, to almost like a, a way of keeping track of your record, right? Um, and uh, but but the other thing too, I was like, well, you know, like, you know, th- this would be a good way to meet people and, and talk cool stock ideas with. Um, you know, because I was really active, you know, again, on, on the, the corner of Berkshire, met a lot of really cool people on there, um, you know, who actually wanted to do, you know, a fair bit of business with, um, you know, met some of the smartest people I've ever met, uh, ever, because, because of that. I mean, you know, the, the, you know, the list is pretty long and, 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 you know, ultimately, like, yeah, I mean, just the more you're talking to people, the, the better it is. And, and that's kind of migrated to Twitter, I think. Um, which is just a, a really great place to, to talk stocks and uh, whatnot. But yeah, I mean, there was a networking aspect, you know, kind of seeing your record and, you know, ultimately just getting your ideas out there. Um, you know, it, 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 it's really kind of fun to do that and, and kind of see the, the feedback that you can get from people. I mean, um, you know, you, you can get a lot of feedback that way. And, and, and also, when you start talking to people, things that you've done may spark something in their head that makes them think of something you could look at. And then you can kind of bounce that back and forth and, and think of different ways to assess value of things. Absolutely. So I'm not, so I, maybe, maybe I, you, you mentioned that you're a Star Wars fanatic. I'm assuming Ragnar as a pirate has something to do with Star Wars, does it? Or? No, no. Okay. Um, no, I, I read Atlas Shrugged when I was like 17 or 18. Okay. Um, my brother got me a copy of it. Uh, and uh, I read it as one of the characters in the book. And I thought he was a pretty cool character. So, you know. There you go. That, that shows you how well read I am. You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people would say you're not missing out on Idrain. Uh, <laughs> <No. laughs> you know, 
I'll, I'll get there one day, you know, maybe I'll, you know, one day. I got all these, I, you know, what, you think I read all these books? Yeah, you know, this is, this is a hat for show right now, you know. Is, that, is some, it Paul Johnston's American History uh, there in the middle? The one that's uh, red, white, and blue in the middle? Yeah, right here. Yep. Yeah. Did I've you got that, that one? Uh, man, I, I had a job at Kroger in college where I worked like night shift at the register before they had use scans for everything. And I would read that, uh, um, at, at night when no one was, 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 you know, going through the checkout line. Mm -hmm. I think I got like halfway through it and then I wound up quitting the job to actually go work at a pawn shop and, uh, just kind of put it down. And that was 15 years ago. I should, I should pick it up. I've still got it. Um, it's kind of, kind of interesting. That's awesome. Yeah. I bought, cause so I bought this book. The American Jeremiad and, um, well, I don't have And No Bird Can Sing, but it's, um, or no, wait, it is And No Bird Can Sing. Anyways, it was a thesis that I was writing on in college about, you know, talking about the, the green evolution and like, you know, was this born out of, out of science or, or was there a mix of marketing involved? It, I'm, I'm blanking on the actual, how I had the piece. I thought it was a really good one at the time, but then I realized that like, this is going to take me years to write this. I only had a semester and it yeah. was like the last, and it was like the last one. And I'm like, I'm raging. So yeah. I, I don't know. I, but the books look good, you know? Yeah. yeah. American Jeremy. That was, I actually, I read that one. That, one, that one's a very good book. But um, all right, going back to your investing philosophy. So catch us up. You know, what, what, what kind of what type of investor would you say you are currently? And, and how has that changed over the years? Um, well, I mean, I, I used to be strictly like a net net guy and I really wanted to buy stuff under liquidation value. And I don't know if I kind of changed that because, you know, the, the market for that kind of dried up, um, you know, because I mean, when I when I really got into investing and, in, you know, 2008, 2009, and, and, and that time, like, there were lots of net nets, and, and it, it became very evident very quickly, you needed to try to find some that, like, could take a business downturn and continue losing cash and still have something left, and then at some point, I wound up going for a little bit more quality over stuff, but then it seems like I still always wind up finding these shit codes that I just can't get away from. Um, so, yeah, I mean... I've never been the kind of guy that does a discounted cash flow on something in Excel or Google Sheets or whatever. I just I have no desire to do that. I generally think that the more accurate you try to make them, the more inputs you're going to have, and then ultimately the more that one cell can affect others in really weird ways. And I'm just not smart enough to do that. Um, so I use a lot of rules of thumb for stuff, you know, um, you know, different cash flow multiples and you know, d different things like that. Um, I, I, I like to to read a lot of the filings and kind of get into the nitty gritty and, 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 you know, find interesting aspects about the business. Like, you know, going back to Thrive, one of the things that, you know, I found in the subsequent events, uh, that, which is a really good spot to see things, um, you know, in the last 10 Q, they had a bunch of, they had like a million warrants redeemed, right? So right now the financials you see on Google Finance or Yahoo Finance or Morningstar, wherever you're aggregating your data from, you know, it shows that they've got, probably $14 million less in cash on hand than they actually have um, because of the warrant redemption. And, you know, things like that are kind of interesting. And, you're, you know, certain things, I don't know that an AI program or, you know, um, a data scouring tool or something would ever be able to really detect um, and, and know the true meaning behind something, um, you know. And, uh, yeah, so, so just, you know, reading and, you know, it's, it's kind of a non-answer, right? I mean, you just kind of go where you think value is. And if you see something that you think is worth more than you're paying for it, like, you know, you want to buy it. And sometimes you make calculated bets on things, right? I mean, yeah. you know, a, a good example right now is Godeker, right? I own go, uh, Godeker Warrants, right? And it's not because I think that it's a great company, right? And it's not even, a, I think they're geniuses for the acquisition or at least underpriced. But I think that the warrants are, I think that there's a decent probability that the warrants are drastically underpriced right now. Um, and they certainly were several weeks ago, um, you know, but we'll see, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I invested in that thinking, you know, hey, the warrants, they may be a three or four X, but, you know, they could also be a zero over time. Who knows? But I think it's a compelling bet. So, you know, try to think of things in bets, I guess, and, you know, look for some value for some margin of safety and, you know, throw in whatever, you know, uh, trade lingo you want to. to, to <laughs> other people that. I like that. Um, what was I, I, I was just going to ask you about, uh, oh, it, this term shit codes. I, I feel like I'm, I'm late to the game 
in understanding <laughs> what exact, like, I feel like as a microcap guy and covering the microcap space, I, I feel like I'm, I'm totally out of the loop and like at, at, at a, maybe at a totally other table. Cause I yeah. see like you, I see Richard Sosa mentioning shit, shit codes and like everybody talk about shit codes sometimes. And it's funny, you know, I, I, I find it hilarious, but then half the time I'm also like, all right, are we talking, are we talking about small micro nano caps or is it just shit codes in general? Like, it, cause there's shit codes in small and mid cap too. You know, it's not like it's just limited to there, but are shit codes just in general, are we talking small micro nano caps or what? No, I think it's a pretty broad term. Um, okay, that's but it, whenever, whenever I use it, or, or probably I'd say whenever Richard uses it, you're, you're, you're probably looking at like a micro cap, you know, probably some billion dollar market cap. Uh, those are the ones I, I tend to look at anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think there are probably going to be more price inefficiencies there. And, and especially lately with how like, you know, EFTs and indexes and stuff are working, I think that there's a lot more opportunity for, you know, smaller cap stocks to, you know, get included in as they grow and stuff. You know, you can see some really interesting pricing happen with that. But um, I'd much rather look at those than a big company. I think it's a super interesting term, especially if you're thinking about playing the game. You know, mm -hmm. you're thinking about certain trades and you're thinking like, Oh yeah, shit codes. You know, it's just like I hunt in shit codes, and it's just like oh yeah, he hunts in shit codes, and it's like meanwhile you're like oh this one there's some value here, like this connection. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, my shit code is like less shitty than all the rest. You know, <laughs> this is a real, real, real winner. Um, and it's it's funny because like the, probably one of the first ones that I I looked at that I was really kind of. Uh, I don't know if impress is the right, is the right word, but, but uh, taken by, right, was, you know, ALJ Regional Holdings, right? I mean, I, that to me is like a, a great example of, of a shit code, you know? I mean, it's, it's constantly been over levered, but management seems to be pretty smart. I mean, Jess is a really sharp dude. I mean, there's no doubting that. Um, you know, and, you know, they do all these interesting transactions and stuff and some of them work out, some of them don't, you know, they have leverage cycles and stuff and they've had trouble, you know, kind of working it in the past few years, but, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a good example of one that, that, that I, I think a lot of people, uh, uh, looked at and, you know, made money on and also have, have lost some money on, but, you know, ultimately it's just about, you know, do, do you think that they can outperform what everybody else does? You know, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of a market is, you know, you, it's this voting machine and, you know, who's, who's ever right is going to look smart. And, uh, you know, I, I think there are even cycles in people looking smart and looking dumb, you know, I mean, depending on their investment uh, returns and stuff. I mean, Bill Ackman, you know, he's, he's gone from looking like a genius to looking stupid uh, to looking like a genius again, like, I don't know, probably six times that I can think of. And, and it seems like there's always this core group of people that just hates him in the, the meantime. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see how things go in and out of favor. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, especially, I mean, it, it's, you know, you're taking a risk when you, or you're putting your thoughts and your ideas out there, right? You know, because you're making a heavy stance, like this is what I think about this. This is the bet that I'm making on that. You know, so you're opening yourself up to, you know, well, on the positive side agreement, but then on the negative side, like getting some potential criticism, you know, and it's, it's just the choice that you have to make, especially, but it, I, I think most good investors want that feedback, even especially on the negative side, because you want to be proven wrong. You like, you're going to have a, an against consensus view on something or even maybe, yeah, let's just say against the consensus view on something like, all right, well, why am I dumb? Tell me why I'm dumb. I'd love to know why, mm -hmm. you know? And, and sometimes you, you can even kind of dig your heels in on something you may not want to be digging your heels in on, you know? I mean, like a, a good example for me is Nevada Gold. Uh, it's, it's no longer a public company anymore. But, you know, as that was going up, I, I was probably more convinced that it was worth more than it really was. And I, I think part of that may have been because I'd written about it so much and thought about it so much. Um, and, and that's something that's interesting to think back on. And, and you know, with that one, you know, it, it went down a lot. You know, I mean, it probably got cut to 30% of, of what it, what its highs have been, you know. And, and I was not adding nearly as much as I should have. Even though the thesis, you know, had changed a little bit, I probably knew that company better than most people. And I wasn't investing more in it when it was at like 80 cents a share, right? It ultimately wound up liquidating um, for significantly more than that. It did pretty well. Um, from that that price, but you know, if people were buying it at two bucks, you know, they, they didn't they didn't do well with it. Um, and uh, 
you know, there's just constant lessons to be learned with investing, you know, and, and I, I think part of the game with it is figuring out, you know, not just was I right, was I wrong, but also how did this particular lesson affect me? And is my application of that lesson in the future actually relevant? Um, because all these, you know, things can change, right? I mean, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, high growth companies, right? I mean, um, you know, investing in those, you can, you can get a lot of different lessons from that, you know, like, I mean, over the past 10 years, that's been a very great trade to be investing in SaaS businesses and things with really high rates of growth. But if you were using the lessons that were learned from the crash of, you know, 2000, you would have missed all that, right? So, you know, maybe there's still going to be a, a, a bursting of the NASDAQ or something like that, where, where it crashes a lot. And, you know, you would have missed out on, that crash, but you also would have missed out on the appreciation. So it's just a constant weighing game, and it's it, it, it's 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 a crazy mental game. I think that you're you're constantly playing with yourself. Absolutely. Tell me about that experience a little bit with Nevada Gold. So you know, because look, averaging down that that's that's such a hard mental block because mm-hmm. you because you know even when you know that company inside and out, you're still going in and now buying it under what you originally paid, right? You know, it, it's, I, I'd say, I based on a lot of the interviews I've done, I'd, say, I'd argue that a lot of people, it's easier to average up than it is to average down because you're, you're so confident in that thesis that, hey, I loved it at 30% higher. I really love it at, at 80 cents now because, hey, I know this company inside and out. Mm-hmm. You know, the, I know that the value is there, you know? So what was that, what was that, was that the main lesson that you took from it? Is like, hey, I knew this company inside and out. I knew that this is why this happened, you know. And like, what was that thought process? I mean, so the whole averaging down versus averaging up thing, like, I, I have really mixed uh, feelings about that because I think part of that's also determined on what kind of market you're in, right? I think that when there's a rising market, it's probably going to be harder for you to average down than if the whole market's going down vice versa right um with nevada gold what happened with that is like they had a high growth manager in there and they wound up getting rid of them um because like the growth wasn't happening and stuff and it seemed like there was just a a cultural shift at the board level and i know i wasn't a big fan of that at the time even though it seems like that may have been a a, a decent decision at the time i I really don't know i mean because you know that's one of the things Who, who knows if his plan would have actually wound up working out um, so anyway, the, the stock wound up going down because of that. And they were trying to like, you know, get rid of some of their assets and whatnot. And they had these really weird, like poker rooms in Washington state and stuff. And then they wound up selling back like their slot machine or their, their pull tab operation in uh, South Dakota back to the people that they bought it off of. And that just always looks bad. Um, so, and, and they, they sold it back for like nothing in the revenue share. Um, that, that wound up being just de minimis. Um, so, you know, the stock really went down because of that. And then, you know, there was some other stuff they did that, you know, they fixed some operations and stuff, but there was, there was something there. So for me, it was almost like my thesis had changed and I guess I just got freaked out. I, you know, I mean, that probably happened seven or eight years ago. So it's hard for me to remember a little bit of that, but there have been other instances where I have averaged down, you know, because I felt like I got it. I mean, I remember with uh, Steak and Shake back before it was with Larry Holdings, um, I started buying it at like, I think 8.50 a share. And I got down to seven, I bought more. I got down to six and I bought more. That was pretty young at the time. So I remember it getting down to like, I think it was $3.15. And I literally put the last $500 that I had into it. And, um, it, it, but at the time when it was going down, you know, Lehman Brothers was collapsing, <laughs> right? So that's a little bit, different to do that I feel like because you know at some point you've got to think well if this is really as bad as we're thinking it is and the world's really going to end what does me going broke in this investment matter you know I mean that was kind of my thinking last year with COVID in you know March and April it was literally like I mean at the time we thought that Amazon boxes were going to be killing us um and you know, I remember thinking like, okay, so I'm going to go balls to the wall long on this. I'm going to, on just about everything, use margin on it. And 
if I go broke, I go broke, right? If, if, if the end of the world is, is, is what breaks you, like, okay, that's fine. Like, every, like no one's paper matters if, we're, if half of us are dead. And, um, you know, so, so I think that, that even changes the average down versus average up scenario, right? Um, and I know that in the past year, it seems like it's been very hard for people to average up, you know, because when you see something like, you know, speaking of Sosa, right? You know, he really likes deep end, um, which I don't own. I, I own it a little bit, but, um, you know, I hope to own it at some point in the future. But, you know, when you look at that thing and it's trading for 30 bucks or whatever it's trading for now, and you're saying, man, in like May of last year, I could have got it for four bucks. I just don't know there's any more room to run. You know, you may be making a really big mistake with that. Um, same thing, you know, people were saying that when it was at 20, people were saying that when it was at 10, but obviously buying it at 10 or 15, you would have done really well and doubled your money in less than a year. So, you know, I, I, I don't know that anyone's really smart enough to even know how the lessons that they've, you know, quote, learned in the past can actually apply them in the future. I, I, I think there's a lot of randomness of that and uh, probably some survivorship bias. Um, well, you, well, you brought up a really interesting point when it comes to thinking about it averaging up and averaging down. It's something I, I hadn't really considered. It's like, you know, and, and, and this is coming from two guys. I, I wouldn't say we're macro guys, right? Like, oh, no, it, it, yeah, like it's nice to, it, not, not, that's maybe not the right word, but like in those instances, you should be considering, all right, what's going on? What's, is, is market absolutely tanking? Is there a lot of froth? You know, how, how should, I mean, you know, <clears throat> if you're looking at small micro nanocast, for the most part, it's not really correlated to the to the main markets, of course. You know, that's where we find the inefficiency. That's why we're in it, blah, blah, blah. You know, but at the same time, when you're starting to think about, well, is everything just everything frothy right now? Is everybody just continuing to push, you know, push this up? Or is the market going to complete shit, but the comp core company is still in intact? You know, it's interesting to think about some of those other dynamics at play rather than just, you know, saying, hey, I'm going to hold it here, but without considering some of the other things that are going on. Yeah. yeah, like like what like what else could you put your money into right now that would be a better investment than what you've got? You know, I, I think that's something to consider, too. Like, um, you know, because everybody's talking about how the markets, I, I say, a lot of people, it seems to be the narrative that the market's very high right now. It's like, OK, maybe it is, maybe it is. I, I I don't know. I mean, you know, if you have negative interest rates someday, then the market will look very, very cheap right now. Um, I ultimately don't know what's going to happen with that. All I know is this reminds me a whole lot of 2011, 2012, right? The market, everybody was talking about a double dip recession then and convinced that, you know, every, you know, inflation was going to pick up and we were going to get in this inflationary death spiral. And then at some point there was the stuff in Greece that was uh, going on, and everyone thought that the European financial system was going to collapse. You know, Brexit, Spain, Italy, yeah. Brexit. I mean, there was all this stuff, right? And you know, now looking back on it, I even have trouble remembering some of the countries that were involved in that. And I think other people would too, if they're honest about it. Um, and it's just kind of a blip, right? So remembering back to to those things, like you're you're going to have a little bit of bias to what just stuck with you, right? But you know. And, and part of what reminds me of what makes now remind me of that, that period is again, you know, people are saying everything's frothy, but I'm still finding companies that are relatively compelling, right? I mean, like, you know, for example, Thrive, that's, you know, that's my biggest position. I'm warrants in it. I think it's a very interesting business. I think Tile Shop's very interesting. I think that, um, you know, I don't know, but I think Defense is interesting. You know, um, one, of my, one of my buddies, Chris Owen, you know, he's really big on franchise, right? That's probably very attractively priced. Um, and, uh, I, I think there's lots of pockets of value that people can find, um, if, if you just look for it a little bit and, um, you know, so, you know, I, and, and the other thing that's kind of cool about this is, you know, this, you know, this pod kind of serves as a marker, right? Because, you know, if the, if the market tanks in six months or whatever, my, my, you know, Hey, this reminds me of 2011, 2012 comment. I'm going to look really stupid. Right. Which, you know, that's fine. But, you know, if the market goes up, I'm going to look smart. And uh, but the thing is, I may look smart for reasons that weren't actually part of my thinking. So if the result is is kind of what I predicted, but my reasoning for it was totally, you know, asked backwards. Does that really mean that I knew what was going on or I was just kind of stumbling through space and, you know, postulating on stuff and I just happened to, to get it right? But the opposite could be true, right? Like you could be wrong, but your reasoning was sound. 
like it made it was a logical sound argument right right like it, you know so i mean when it comes to making market predictions and then also when it comes to companies like you know you could have a be totally logical the thesis makes a, a ton of sense and the next thing you know you're like eh, well, it didn't work out right. um, hey real quick on some of the names that you said top shop um earlier alj um are, are you shareholder in any of those i own top shop shares i don't own alj i don't own deep then i own five shares of thrive from a warrant conversion i, I tested out i own warrants in that Franchise group, I don't know, but my buddy Chris does. Fishers obviously owns some defense. Um, Nevada Gold's no longer public. Data Rand's not public. I think that's everything I mentioned. So. Yeah, that's everything. That's everything. That was good. All right, so this is my favorite question I ask everybody on here, and you you talked about quite a few experiences already. But what would you say is the main investing experience that's impacted you the most so far in your career? Um. I don't know. I mean, probably everything that happened with SiteStar, to be honest. Um, you know, we, we, we did an activist campaign uh, on that, which was really interesting. Um, I, I think that it's pretty safe to say that everybody involved in that, you know, thinks that now thinks that going activist on a micro cap company, especially with like a $5 million market cap or whatever, is kind of an insane thing to do. Um, but that's just a lesson you've got to learn. Uh, sometimes. So if you're listening to this, don't go activist on the $5 million nano cap, not worth it. All right. So to close out here, you know, look, you're going to be back on at some point. You're probably going to come on the round table. We're going to talk shop probably ad nauseum at this point for, for a long time. But, you know, for those who may be looking at investing for the first time, and maybe they somehow came across this interview as their first investing interview, you know, what advice would you have for them? How about this? Advice that you have if they're looking at shit codes. How about that? Let's stay on theme. <laughs> um, <laughs> the mark is probably smarter than you. <laughs> it's probably the best advice I've got on that. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, uh, yeah, just stay humble because I, I know I'm not as smart as I, as I occasionally think I am. Uh, so the, mar the market can humble you. So just watch out for that. <laughs> I think that's a great way to end it right there. All right. So Jeff, where can my audience go and find more information, follow you on social media as well as, uh, as your blog too. Yeah. Uh, Ragnar is a pirate uh, is the Twitter handle and uh, Ragnar is a pirate dot blogspot.com. Uh, there's not a whole lot of stuff on there, but yeah. Um, drop a line, say, Hey, um, love to talk to people. Very cool. Well, Jeff, thank you for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Good luck. Stay safe. Well, we're, we're opening up, but stay safe even as we open up. And yeah. Um, yeah, man, have a great weekend. I look forward to our next chat. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not an offer or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell securities. SNN Network, SNN Inc., and the Planet Microcap Podcast and the representatives are not licensed brokers, broker dealers, market makers, investment bankers, investment advisors, analysts, or underwriters. We do not recommend any companies discussed. We may buy and sell securities in any company mentioned and may profit in the event those securities rise in value. We recommend you consult with a professional investment advisor, broker, or legal counsel before purchasing or selling any securities referenced in this podcast. This episode of the Planet Microcap Podcast is brought to you by Friedman LLP, a top 40 global accounting, tax, and business consulting and advisory firm, providing a full spectrum of services for public and private companies since 1924. Contact Friedman when you will need to raise capital and adhere to U.S. standards. The Friedman Partners will work diligently with you to provide the financial assurance, regulatory, and transactional services you need. When the stakes are highest, Friedman makes sure you are well equipped. For more information and to get a Friedman free consultation, please call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E -E at FriedmanLLP.com. Again, for more information and a free consultation, call 856-830-1660 or email Neil Levine at N-L-E-V-I-N-E -E at FriedmanLLP.com.